May of 1942, Midway Island, Midway in the vast Pacific. American sailors stationed here considered it a quiet outpost. They had no idea that the Japanese, after their Coral Sea embarrassment, were devising a plan to crush this serene base and America's naval power forever. But this plan would backfire, and an overmatched U.S. Navy would change the balance of power in the Pacific in the Battle of Midway. Isoroku Yamamoto was the Imperial Navy's commander-in-chief. This Harvard-educated admiral had been the architect behind the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. He now wanted to crush the U.S. Navy before they got back on their feet. To do so, Yamamoto led a mighty fleet into battle comprised of four fleet carriers, three light carriers, 11 battleships, 21 cruisers, and 402 planes. The Americans could only scrape together three carriers, eight cruisers, and 250 planes. The odds at Midway were overwhelmingly in favor of Japan. Yamamoto had designed an intricate scheme to destroy the United States Navy. First, he would launch an attack on America's Aleutian Islands. He expected this diversion would draw the U.S. Navy north, while his aircraft carriers launched a strike on Midway Island. Yamamoto's air attack would be followed by a troop landing of 5,000 soldiers. From Pearl Harbor, the remains of the U.S. Navy would rush to the rescue of Midway, only to be ambushed by Japan's main naval force lurking several hundred miles away. But as in the Battle of the Coral Sea, the diligence of U.S. Navy codebreakers revealed the Japanese plan. On Midway, the U.S. forces prepared for the expected invasion. Pilots fresh out of flight school manned Avenger torpedo planes, B-17s, Wildcat fighters, and Catalina patrol bombers. Admiral Chester Nimitz, the American commander, knew the Japanese offensive would come between June 3rd and 5th. His plan was simple. If he could sneak his carriers within range of Midway, he could launch a surprise attack. Nimitz said this required exquisitely precise timing, a monumental dose of luck, or both. Nimitz secretly rushed the carrier's Hornet and Enterprise back from the South Pacific. There was also the badly damaged USS Yorktown, which Yamamoto thought had been sunk in the Coral Sea. Its skipper told Nimitz the ship needed 90 days for repairs. Nimitz gave him three. Admiral Frank Fletcher on the Yorktown was in overall control of the Midway fleet, while Admiral Raymond Spruance commanded the carrier's Enterprise and Hornet. Spruance, who had never before commanded a carrier, was a replacement for Bull Halsey, who had been hospitalized from exhaustion. Against him would be Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. He led Japan's first striking force, comprised of the carriers Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu. Behind the carriers was Admiral Yamamoto himself to make sure the battle went as planned. Yamamoto had predicted after Pearl Harbor that he would be able to control the Pacific for six months before American war production caught up with Japan's. Nearly six months had passed. Yamamoto hoped his attack on Midway would keep him a step ahead of his prophecy. The morning of June 4th, the Akagi turns into the wind to launch 108 planes on a mission to take out the U.S. defenses at Midway Island. U.S. radar picks them up 93 miles from their target. The Americans are ready. So are Navy cameramen who capture the battle in color. 
The Japanese, expecting to surprise the Americans, as they did at Pearl Harbor, are surprised themselves when they meet strong resistance over Midway. In 25 minutes of battle, 38 of the 108 Japanese planes are shot down. Of the 26 American aircraft, only six survived the attack. A seaplane hangar and a fuel dump explode. Midway's powerhouse and water plant are demolished. But the Americans' runways and anti-aircraft guns are left standing. The last Japanese Zeros to leave radio back to Nagumo that a second strike will be needed. Nagumo does not know whether or not to launch a second strike. He is certain that Japanese soldiers cannot invade the island unless the American defenses are annihilated. But arming his planes for a second airstrike will take precious time and leave Nagumo's carriers vulnerable to an American carrier attack. Nagumo takes the risk, believing that the American carriers are days away from Midway. He orders his planes to make ready, unaware that the U.S. carriers are only hours away. His decision to launch a second strike is the pivot point of the Battle of Midway. Admiral Spruance's U.S. task force has been closing in since dawn. Spruance knew Nagumo's carriers would be exposed as the Japanese planes returned from their attack on Midway. When Spruance came within 170 miles of Nagumo, his fighter plane's maximum range, he threw all of his cards on the table. The man who had never before commanded a carrier launched every plane he had. The American pilots quickly found Nagumo's fleet. But the more experienced Japanese pilots flying these highly maneuverable Zeros shot down most of the U.S. torpedo bombers before they ever reached the carrier. Not one of the Japanese ships took a serious hit. More than 100 U.S. planes were destroyed. A stunned American pilot said, it was like the inside of a beehive. But as the low-flying American torpedo bombers were being shot down, the real U.S. threat was about to appear. A wave of American dive bombers flying high above found the Japanese fleet and began peeling off. The Japanese carriers, busy rearming planes for Nagumo's second strike, were helpless. Unloaded bombs and fuel lines carelessly littered their flight decks. Their protective screen of zeros were too low to fight off this attack. In six minutes, the American dive bombers demolished three Japanese carriers. Those six minutes changed the balance of power for the rest of the Pacific War. The Akagi, Soryu, and the Kaga were all sunk. At noon, Japanese planes from their one surviving carrier found the Yorktown. This would be the Yorktown's final battle. Three bombs and two torpedoes later, she was dead in the water. One observer said the great ship looked like a tired colossus, hurt beyond pain. This time, there would be no repairs for the Yorktown. At 3 p.m., the crew was ordered to abandon ship. A Japanese sub eventually put the Yorktown to rest on the ocean floor. At 5 p.m., Spruance pulled together a squadron to return the favor. 
The last remaining Japanese flat top, the Hiryu, was sitting defenseless without support from the three sunken Japanese carriers. American pilots tripled the Hiryu. For seven hours, the 1,100-member crew tried to salvage the Empress flagship, but to no avail. The Japanese national anthem warned the sailors to abandon ship. The admiral and captain stayed aboard, and after radioing an apology to Nagumo, went down with the ship. With Nagumo's carriers destroyed, Yamamoto ordered his fleet to withdraw. Six months after Pearl Harbor, his prophecy had come to pass in the Battle of Midway. Yamamoto would never again be on the offensive in World War II. The reality of Midway rocked Japan's leadership, but news of the crushing defeat was hidden from the Japanese people. Prime Minister Tojo instead trumpeted the meaningless and unopposed landings in the Aleutian Islands as a great Japanese victory. American pilots returning from the battle knew better. Japan had lost four carriers while the Americans only lost one. Japan's military edge was gone forever. One senior Japanese official said, at Midway, the Americans avenged Pearl Harbor. <laughs>